In 2003, I got the opportunity to sit down with the wonderful artist Ken Howard, who was also the president of the Royal Academy of Arts. He explained to me how you can become a member of the Royal Academy and how you can become elected president of the Royal Academy of Arts. My name's Ken Howard and I've been a member of the Academy now for 20 years. Um, on the whole, you get elected to the Academy when you're around about 50. Some people earlier, but round about. And I showed in the Academy for 32 years before I was made a member, which is quite a long run. I started showing when I was 18, and I was 50 when they decided that they wanted me. And um, so I became a member of the Academy at that time. Um, People often wonder how you do be actually become a member and that the process is that they notice your work over some years. When I was elected, they noticed it mainly in the summer exhibition, which isn't necessarily true anymore. People are sometimes elected through other exhibitions. Anyway, they, they would see your work over many years, and then they would put you on a list of candidates, which meant that when an RA dies, then they have to elect a new one. There are a stock number of us, you see. There are 80 of us um, at any one time. So it's dead men's shoes. So when an RA dies in a particular category, then they elect somebody into that category. Uh, the painters have the most, there's 50 painters. And um, the others are made up of, I think it's 12 architects, 12 sculptors, and six printmaker and draftsmen. Anyway, when a vacancy comes, they go to this list of candidates. And the members then are sent the list of current candidates. And then we have what's called a General Assembly, when all the members get together at Burlington House and we go through a rather arch archaic but very fair election process, um, where in the first count, the, anybody that gets more than four votes goes on to the board. In the next count, the three with the most votes go on the, are left on the board. In the next count, you get the two have got the highest votes, and finally, you go through a wonderful thing of putting a ball in a box where you vote for the person you want. And it's very, very secretive. Um, at an election, nobody is allowed to sort of speak up for somebody. All that's got to have been done before. So there is no sort of uh, selling someone or anything at the actual election. So it is a very democratic process. Once you're elected, you're there for life. Um, the only way that they've ever sacked a member of the Academy was many years ago when one went down into the schools and spoke against a fellow academician to the students. That is the worst thing you can possibly do, and he got the sack. <laughs> does the Academy have a royal affiliation? Well, it was formed 250 years ago. There aren't any other academies, I think I'm right in saying, that have been around as long as ours. The reason why we are still around is we change. We're not cutting edge, an academy cannot be cutting edge, but we absorb what's happening a little bit after it's cutting edge and people probably don't notice that it isn't any more cutting edge, but we evolve. The Academy evolves and changes all the time. It never revolts, therefore we can't sack members. Once you're a member of the Academy, you are a member, and that's its great strength, because when you come in, you're relatively avant-garde, for want of a better word. You're about whatever is going on at the time. <laughs> 
And then after you've been in for 20 years like me, you're sort of middle of the road to, to the more traditional end of the academy. By the time I drop off the perch, I'll be very much going out, quite right, and there'll be a new lot coming in. So in that 250 years, the academy has always had different factions, and I don't mean that in terms of people falling out, but different factions within it, and that's its strength. How did Royal come into yep. the Academy? The, uh, the original suggestion of the Academy was the King of England, suggester, was the King of England, who I believe was, I should know, but I don't, um, a George, one of the Georges. And it, the Academy was set up in order to promote art and design in Britain. And it was set up originally to set up the schools of the Royal Academy and the summer exhibition, which was a way that artists, working artists, could have their work seen by the public. But it was set up by the King of England. But King George didn't have any intention to paint or... No, no. And, he, and I don't think he gave us any money. He just gave it the Royal Assent. And then, and then the first Sir Joshua Reynolds, who, you know, everybody knows that name, the great portrait painter, he was the first president. Now, when it was set up, it was different from what it is now. People were made associates of the Royal Academy first, and then, and they were made quite young, not when they were 50. I mean, Turner was made an associate when he was, I think, in his very early 20s, maybe even before. But if you're going to elect anybody that early, they may go off. So you don't make them full academicians, you make them associates. And when you're convinced that they are, you know, there for good, you made them a full academician. So if you look at the early records of the academy, you would find that some men died as associates. They never became full RAs. Whereas now we elect people as full RAs. And this was partly because we wanted to encourage people like, say, David Hockney. You couldn't ask a man like David Hockney, who, when he was elected, had a very big reputation. You couldn't say to him, we want you to be an associate of the Academy. He'd say, thanks very much. I don't know whether he would have done, but that was the reasoning. So we decided, in order to get people like Hockney, like Peter Blake, like the very many Lord Foster, for instance, to become members, we'd make them members, everybody members, straight away. Um, so it was founded by a king, and ever since that day, its main reasons for being have been the summer exhibition and the schools. Then there was the winter exhibition, which were grand, exhibitions of maybe Italian art or Japanese art or whatever. And then, gradually, because we had to earn our living, we then had more exhibitions. And now, the Academy is one of the major exhibiting galleries in the country, if not the major one. I mean, we've just had the, the massive Aztecs exhibition. We spent 3.4 million pounds putting that exhibition on. 3.4 million that we had to earn, and we earned it. Now we've just had the Dresden, the works from Dresden. That cost us quite a lot of money to, to put on. So, and um, after the summer exhibition, we've got the Vuillard exhibition, and then the Philip Guston exhibition, the American painter. So it's gradually evolved into being more of a great exhibiting gallery, but it was originally founded for the schools and the summer exhibition. Like most painters, over the period of one's life, one's done um, self-portraits. Yeah. So in my last show, I had one that I did when I was, um, the earliest one I've got is when I was 16, 
My last show I had one that I did when I was in the Marines as a National Serviceman. And then I did another one in that show, which was, the show was called Ken Out of 70. So it was a painting that I did not that much before this one. Over the years, various people have given awards to the Academy. There was, for instance, Mr. Wollaston, who was a, a businessman. Uh, I believe he lived down in Bournemouth or somewhere, but he loved the Academy. So um, he gave a large amount of money, um, the capital of which is never touched, but it produces a prize every year of around about £25,000, which is quite big. It's as big as the Turner Prize. Never gets the publicity that the Turner Prize gets, but it is as big. Winsor & Newton give a, a prize for watercolour each year. Um, a fellow called Jack Goldhill gives a prize of £12,000 every year for the most distinguished piece of sculpture. But these prizes are all given by individuals, they're not Arts Council. An important thing that one should say about the Academy is that it doesn't receive a penny from anywhere official. It gets nothing from the Arts Council, it gets nothing from government, we are an independent institution which we're very proud of and very selfish about because it means our schools which we fund the RA schools which is one of the major art, art schools in the country is financed by the Academy and therefore we, d we don't have to answer to any governmental body about how we educate our students The Academy itself is independent, so we don't have to consider whether the exhibitions that we put on are going to be approved of by some body somewhere that maybe would turn around and say they've all got to be avant-garde or they've all got to be about the young or they've all got to be about this. Or The Academy decides what exhibitions they're going to put on and they put on an incredible variety from Monet to Sensations, which was you know, an incredibly sort of um, avant-garde or innovative exhibition. But, but the Academy is independent, and that's very important to remember. And for a business of covering 20 million a year, to have to cover its expenses, which we have to do. But then we've got various things. We've got our friends. We've got the largest friends organization in the world. We've got something like 90,000 Friends of the Royal Academy. We've then got the American Friends of the Royal Academy, which are very keen and give us an enormous amount of money for refurbishing or rebuilding or, or adding to the Academy. And they just like to be involved in something British that is, is basically founded in tradition, um, and the American Friends are one of our great donors. The Friends are a great donor. We then have various sort of foundations which we have established ourselves, which give us an income. Then we have the exhibitions program that give us an income. Then from the summer exhibition, we sell over two million pounds worth of work in the summer exhibition, of which the artists give 30% to the Academy, that is the Commission. By comparison to Bond Street, that is very little. Bond Street Commission is around about 50%, but that gives another income to the Academy. So the Academy gradually makes its own income. The Academy is run, in inverted commas, by the RAs. And they are, it is run by a council of RAs, which are 12 RAs which turn over every two years. Now, I've just completed my two years. I come up by rote. I now come off and somebody else will come on. And I won't be asked to serve again for about eight or nine years when my turn comes up again by the road. This is a very democratic process because it stops 
maybe a group that want to have control getting control because you serve by rote on the year that you were elected. Um, and that uh, council makes all the main decisions about the Royal Academy. It must be the only business of that size that is run by a lot of artists. Um, and the turnover is roughly 20 million a year. Now, when I say it's run by the members, obviously we've got a fantastic staff that make work whatever we decide. So in fact, there's a bursar, there's a secretary, there is a head of events, there is a exhibitions organizer. There are all these mem all these uh, people who are employed by the Academy. And there are over 200 of them. So there's a big staff and they are in fact, the people that make the members ideas work if you like. But the members make the basic philosophy of the Academy and if the members decide something is not going to happen, it doesn't happen. Sorry, it's all right now, I'm already... Yeah, and I painted it down in Venice and um, uh, I've got a studio in Venice and painted it there. Do you know people that have your works yeah. in their collections? Yeah. Could you name some of those people? Uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose I could. John Cleese of um, Fish Called Wanda. <laughs> He's got several. Prince of Wales. He's got several. Prince Charles. Lord Hanson of the Hanson Trust, big businessman. Yeah, this is one of my six paintings in this year's summer exhibition. Um, each member by right can send in six pieces um, and these are normally hung. The hanging committee does have the right to say either they're all, you know, maybe they're all very big and would you mind replacing one of them with a smaller picture? But basically the, the, the members do have the right to send six pieces in. So this year I've sent this one, which is a medium sized one, two small pictures in the small south room. And then these two up here, um, the one of well, model in my studio and the one of Venice. Um, and then the third one is to do in Northern Ireland, where I worked as the official war artist, this one over here. Yeah, this is one that's the, uh, if you like, the other side of my personality. In 1973, I went to Northern Ireland as the official war artist uh, of the Imperial War Museum. And I worked there for 10 years, off and on. I didn't live in Northern Ireland for 10 years, but off and on. The very first painting that I sold in an exhibition, back when I started exhibiting at the Academy, um, it wasn't sold in the Academy, it was in another exhibition, but I had one in the Academy at that price, was £12. And, and that picture that I sold for £12 in those days would now be £6,000. Great investment man. But that just shows you how paintings do, through demand, do eventually go up in price. And when I sold my first picture for £12, I was delighted. £12 was a lot of money. Mine, for instance, this year, vary from 1900 up to £30,000. But really, I'm, I've, I'm always delighted when somebody buys a picture when they can't really afford it, you know, and they say, I want the picture so much, can I pay over several months or, you know, even. that delights me. I think, was, I think, you know, I think we need paintings. I think people need paintings as much as they need everything else. When I was very young, I had, um, I used to show my pictures on the railings at Hampstead. Uh, when I was at the art school because didn't have any money and um, grant, a grant, a major grant was £1.40 a week in those days. Um, and I sold a picture up at Hampstead one day, a, a little man came up to me in an old raincoat and, and my picture was £3 and he offered me two for it. And I said, done. 
and he said, can you deliver it? And so I delivered it to him on the Monday morning. And when I got to his house in Highgate, he said, would you like to come in and see my other pictures? And I went into his house and it was full of pictures. The walls were covered and they were stacked against the wall. There was no grand furniture and he didn't have a grand car or anything. And I started to look at them and he had Degas, he had Flamenc, he had Henry Moore, he had Graham Sutherland, he had everybody from roughly the turn of the last century. And I said to him, how did you get this collection? And he said, I've only had one passion all my life and that's been collecting pictures. I've never married, I've never worried about a big house. And he said, I've never paid more than 25 pounds for a painting. And he had Degas and Vuillard and Bonnard, and he used to go around to their studios, you know, because he was a man in his, probably in his late seventies. But he had a passion for pictures. Now you can't ev ask everybody to have a passion, but you could ask everybody, don't put pictures at the lowest place in your priorities. You know, which people usually do. They get their car, they get their house, they dress their wife, they have their good furniture, they um, make sure the holidays are in place, and then anything is over, they think, oh, I might buy a picture. Which, you know, it's wonderful if they do in that case. But in fact, I think paintings, not because I'm a painter, I collect paintings myself, uh, other people's paintings, because the arts are necessary to our life just as much as food or roof, well, well, no, maybe not roof, that's silly. You know, we've got to have somewhere to live and we've got to eat food. But, but, but the art shouldn't be right down the bottom of the priority, really, I don't think. And if you buy a picture and you've got taste, um, there is no reason why it shouldn't have been as good an investment as anything else. But you don't buy them for that reason. You know, if if you buy a picture, if you bought one of my pictures for twelve quid and it's worth six thousand, you haven't lost anything on it. You know, it, you probably wouldn't have made any more if it had been sort of safely invested, if you like. But you don't buy pictures for investment. You buy pictures because you love them. You know, and they are necessary to your life, really.